I'm going to be taking a bunch of creative liberties with the story in today's episode. Because see, at the time I'm making this, all we have for Godzilla vs. Kong is the first trailer. So I can use inspiration and information from the past MonsterVerse movies, but I can't make the story super similar to what happens in Godzilla vs. Kong, because I don't know what happens in Godzilla vs. Kong. I will be using some fan speculation as well as stuff that I just pulled from watching the trailer, so fair warning, technically speaking there could be a spoiler in this video. The last character that I'm drawing for this video is one that's very heavily been speculated to show up in Godzilla vs. Kong, so if you don't want to know anything about the movie, maybe you shouldn't watch this video yet. But if you've been in any Godzilla video comment section or seen any videos on speculation of what characters might be showing up, you probably already know what character I'm talking about. Still wanted to give that warning just in case. Hopefully lots of you still want to watch this anyway, so let's jump right into the story and artwork, shall we? Let's go. Hit like, if you want. Subscribe, if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. When the first superhuman, Ishiro Tanaka, had revealed himself to the world in the mid-1950s, people assumed this was ushering in a new era for humanity. And while they may have been right in a way, little did humanity know there was actually a place where hundreds of superhumans had been living quietly for centuries. Hidden away from the world, protected by hurricane-like winds, was Skull Island. The island was a place where superhumans had lived and thrived alongside the non-powered natives of the land. The peace was kept by a family who were essentially considered the royals of the island, the Kong family. Edgar and Miriam Kong kept some of the more violent residents on the island in check and ensured no unwanted visitors came to the island, which, despite the storm protecting it, did happen occasionally. In the modern day, Ishiro Tanaka is known by all as the hero Godzilla who helped stop the Ghidorah brothers' rampage two years ago. But back in the 50s when he first emerged, he'd been seen as a villainous eco-terrorist. After his first rampage against Tokyo, he'd needed a place to lay low, so he'd found his way to Skull Island, using his super strength and durability to fight through the storm. But he was not welcomed by the Kongs. Now, while communication was difficult as they didn't speak the same language, Ashiro managed to convey that he'd needed a place to hide away, but the Kongs didn't like the idea that anyone may come looking for him there. When he refused to leave, the two Elder Kongs fought Ishiro, and the two of them, together, were more than enough to beat him. Edgar Kong had even hit him hard enough to smash off the frilled plates from Ishiro's supersuit that had been meant to help channel his atomic blast abilities. Ishiro eventually fled the island with a new hatred for the Kong family. Of course, he'd never get a chance at a rematch with the Elder Kongs. They'd eventually fall in battle to a group of villains on the island called the Skullcrawler Gang who their son, Willis Kong, would have to put in check himself. And it wasn't an easy task for him. His parents had had each other as backup, but he was essentially alone. For a time, at least. See, early in Willis Kong's reign, a group of explorers and militants had found their way to Skull Island. Kong hadn't spoken their language, so it had been hard for the explorers of the group to explain that they meant no harm to the island or its residents. So when Kong defensively struck the first blow, the fighters of the group leapt into action. But of course, they were no match for Kong. Even as a younger hero, he had incredible power thanks to his inherited abilities of the King Ape, a power set that had been passed down through his family for centuries. Along with strength, speed, and durability that would continue to enhance as he grew, Willis had opposable toes like an ape and was hyper-intelligent. Midway through his battle with the intruders, the Skullcrawler gang attacked, hoping to catch Kong off guard while he was weakened from this other fight. The explorers initially started retreating, leaving Kong to fight the villains on his own. But luckily, one of them, by the name of Bill Randa, convinced some of the others to help Kong fight. Some joined in, and well, they weren't a huge assist to the hero, with that little bit of extra help, Kong managed to finally defeat the Skullcrawler gang. And while Kong would still be wary of allowing others to come to the island, this event would establish a friendship with the outside world, and specifically with the explorers who'd funded the journey. Turned out they'd been from an organization called Monarch, specifically looking to study superhumans. And this alliance would be essential for Monarch in a future conflict that they wouldn't be able to handle without Kong.
Now, as we've said, Ishiro Tanaka was modernly seen as the hero who'd help take down the Ghidorah brothers, but he'd still managed to keep his life and identity very private. So almost nobody knew that years prior to his emergence for the battle with the Ghidorah brothers, he'd briefly settled down and had a son with a woman in America. The boy had been named Adam Tanaka, and he'd been born with the same powers as his father. In fact, his abilities seemed to be evolving beyond even Ishiro's. In spite of this, when the Ghidorah brothers had attacked, Ishiro had believed that his son wasn't ready to help fight, and he'd forced him to stay behind. Luckily, Ishiro, with help from a new friend, had managed to defeat the villains. But afterwards, unknown to the rest of the world, Ishiro would never return home to his family. In a weakened state due to the fight, a group called Apex Cybernetics had secretly captured Ishiro and taken him in for experimentation, hoping to create their own superpowered being that they could control to do their bidding. Of course, Adam had to slowly piece all this information together over the next few years, as he was out looking for his father. And eventually he found, in an abandoned Apex lab, evidence that the group was being jointly funded by the American and Japanese militaries. This sent him into a rage. He donned an old prototype costume of his father's and went on a rampage, destroying a dozen army bases. Things escalated as the army obviously fought back, and it turned into a war, one that the humans would have a very difficult time winning without help. To the public eye, this was simply Godzilla reverted back to his villainous ways of his first emergence. When he'd fought the Ghidorah brothers, there had been so much smoke and clouds and rain that the news footage from the event had been difficult to make out, so people didn't recognize that this new Godzilla was in fact a different person. And of course, it would never be revealed by Apex to the public that Ishiro had been captured to be experimented on. With Godzilla seeming to be on a mindless villainous rampage, the world needed a response. While Apex Cybernetics secretly had their own plan almost prepared, Monarch turned to the one ally they thought they could get to help. Eileen Andrews, one of the current heads of Monarch, set off to Skull Island to see if she could recruit Kong into fighting for humanity. Little did she know, he was dealing with his own problems on Skull Island. Just jumping in as a reminder that I've got a bunch of merch similar to the stuff that I'm doing in this video up on my Teespring store. I've got posters and shirts of my venomized Godzilla and my Godzilla characters as Transformers. And of course, if you like my superhero art, I've got a big bundle of inks of a bunch of my different superhero and villain characters that I've drawn in the past that you can download and color yourself. All that stuff should be linked in the little bar underneath this video. Maybe I'll make some posters out of this stuff too. Let me know if you want that. Haven't decided yet. But anyway, sorry for the interruption. Let's get back into the rest of the story. On Skull Island, unaware about what was going on with the rest of the world, Kong was facing off against some new villains, seemingly trying to rise to power on the island. The Warbat twins, Ran and Ichizo Nozuki, were doing everything they could to take down Kong. While they couldn't match his strength or durability, they had far better mobility. See, they'd both been born with wings, and they could spawn long tail-like whips from their forearms to attack their foes from afar. What Kong couldn't understand was why they were attacking now. They'd lived on the island for years and never done anything villainous before. They'd always seemed a bit devious, but they'd never acted against him or the other residents of the island. In a lull between battles with the twins though, Eileen arrived on the island with some other monarch people to ask Kong for help in stopping Godzilla's rampage. And while Kong knew he had to deal with the Warbat problem, he also remembered his parents warning him of Godzilla, and if he ever returned, Kong was to fend him off once more. His father had even forged a weapon for Willis from a broken piece of Ishiro's armor to help him in the fight. He wielded this weapon and promised to help Monarch as soon as he dealt with the Warbat twins. Unfortunately, the fight with Godzilla would come to Kong before he was ready. See, someone in Monarch, secretly working for Apex Cybernetics, had leaked to the press that Monarch was headed to ask Kong for help, and in this leak they made up the fact that this was a military convoy. Adam had seen this and followed after them. He got to the island ready to attack Monarch when Kong stepped in to protect them. 
Adam too had been told about the Kongs by his father, so he had a personal grudge against the so-called heroes who'd fought his father away when he needed a place to be safe. And so the battle between Kong and Godzilla began and shook the island. Adam had range on his side with his atomic blasts, but Kong was smarter and faster, and the axe his father had built for him from Ishiro's armor doubled as a shield absorbing the atomic energy that Godzilla fired at him. In the midst of the battle, the Warbat twins jumped in, trying to make sure both heroes were killed in the fight. They'd swoop in and out, striking at both Kong and Godzilla. While doing this, Ran Nazuki would be blasted from the air by a stray blast from Godzilla, and the monarch onlookers would take the opportunity to bind her, ensuring she couldn't re-enter the battle. Aside from that though, all Eileen and the monarch workers could do was watch from the sidelines as the two battled it out. Neither hero was in their prime when the fight had begun. Kong had been weakened from his fight with the Warbat Twins, and Godzilla was coming into the fight off the end of a rampage and a days long swim to the island. Approaching the end of the battle, neither of them were in a good way, being very evenly matched and chipping away at each other, pushing each other's durability to their limits. Godzilla finally fired a stream of constant atomic energy from his hands, but Kong held it off with his axe, absorbing all the energy. Kong pushed through the blast, leapt at Godzilla, and with a turbocharged axe, struck him in the head. The axe exploded against Godzilla's helmet. The weapon was destroyed, but when the shockwave cleared, Adam was down. And that was when Monarch workers heard Ran Nazuki speak into a communicator on her mask. Warbat to Apex. Godzilla is down and Kong is weakened. Send in the prototype. Apex Cybernetics had known for a while that Adam Tanaka had been hunting them down to find his father. So they'd constructed a plan. A plan that could help them take down the only heroes they believed capable of defeating the mechanical hero that they were building. They'd plant evidence linking themselves to the American and Japanese militaries, who in actuality they had no ties to. As they'd hoped, this sent Adam into a rage attacking the militaries, showing the world that Godzilla was not to be trusted and that humanity needed its own fully controllable hero to protect them. Using the atomic energy from their superhuman prisoner, Ishiro Tanaka, they managed to build and power their own version of Godzilla, but they still wanted some of the world's stronger heroes out of the way. They'd hired the Warbat Twins to try and take down Kong, knowing it was unlikely that they'd succeed, but at least hoping they could weaken him so that they could trick Adam into killing him. The fight hadn't gone as they'd expected, they'd been certain that Godzilla was going to win, but regardless, as soon as Adam was down, they sent in their mechanical menace to finish off Kong. The mech charged into battle, catching Kong completely off guard. His axe had been shattered, so he had no defense when this new foe shot a crimson beam of altered atomic energy at him. He tried to dodge it, but was easily struck and smashed to the ground. Mechagodzilla was fast and ruthless. He got to Kong and began pounding him into the dirt. The tired hero blocked a few blows, but there was little he could do in this weakened state. The mech raised its arms for a lethal blow, when a blue burst of light lit up the island as another atomic blast shot at Mecha Godzilla, knocking him off of Kong. Godzilla picked himself up. The blow to Adam's helmet had been enough to knock him out, but the combination of wearing a helmet and having superhuman durability had meant that Adam had lived through Kong's final strike. Adam still had beef with Kong, but seeing a mechanized version of his and his father's hero persona was enough to flag to Godzilla that something was awry, and if Kong was willing to fight this thing, then they at least could temporarily work together. With both of them weakened, it wasn't a fight either of them could win alone. They leapt into battle with a tenuous alliance. Godzilla was wearing down the mech from a distance with his atomic energy, and between blasts, Kong would leap in and hammer some devastating punches before jumping back again to let Godzilla shoot once more. Slowly, they chipped away at the armored menace until he was barely a skeleton of himself. The two heroes charged in in unison and simultaneously swung their fists straight into the villain's chest, sending him rocketing backwards into a mountain and exploding. 
Afterwards, a monarch translator moderated a conversation between Kong and Godzilla. They still weren't the biggest fans of one another, but they agreed to temporarily team up once more, to find Adam's father and take down what was left of Apex Cybernetics. As they did so, Monarch would do what they could to expose Apex as the masterminds behind Godzilla's rampage. There was still much work to be done, but at least for now, the day had been won by the heroes, Godzilla and Kong. I definitely think this was a lot better than the last time I did Godzilla characters as superheroes. I mean, if you want to go back and watch that one, if you haven't seen it, you can. This is the same universe as that one, and I was referencing the characters from that episode in this episode, but I do think this one was a lot better. I do also plan on doing another round of this in the, you know, near-ish future, because I want to turn some more of the old-school Godzilla monsters into superheroes and villains as well, like Anguirus and Destroya and lots of the other cool characters. But of course, if you're new here, I've also got a few other Godzilla kind of videos on the channel. I've venomized them and recently turned them into Transformers. Those are both story-focused episodes as well. I think they're lots of fun. But anyway, everybody, that's all for today. I'm Christian Pearson. This has been Popcraft Studios, home of the nerdiest art videos on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next one on Friday. Goodbye.